that really gets the configuration of non governmental organizations, civil society organizations. Uh, one of my lament as Congo president is that by its own constitution, Congo cannot fight for the rights of NGOs uh, in the home countries where they are and citing governments for their violation of civil society. I salute Civicus because in its statute it is able to fight for the rights of NGOs to speak their mind with respect to the public policies that their governments uh, do and therefore sometimes when it muzzles that voice, Civicus speaks. But Jeffrey has been a chair of the NGO DPI for as long as I've been here in many capacities and so I have enjoyed my time as Congo president and he was DPI chair and so <coughs> we have uh, collaborated on many uh, uh, things together. Jeffrey, first day. Thank you very much, Levy, and, and, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've, been, I've had the privilege of uh, working with NGOs here at the United Nations since 1996 in one of my previous incarnations. I was even a representative for the U.S. affiliate of the Baha'i International Community. So I've had the pleasure of working with the United Methodist and others in interfaith capacities over the last uh, many years. And more recently, since 2009, I represent Civicus World Alliance for Citizen Participation, which is based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. As, and I'm serving as our UN representative here in New York. We have another uh, UN representative uh, in Geneva, Renata Bloom, who had previously served as president of Congo as well. So you can see there are many interconnections. Uh, regarding um, what I've heard so far, what I'd like to focus on is how, in, how we can make the link between the local, the national, and the global, and how vitally important it is for us to make that link uh, here at the United Nations in particular. As, as global citizens, as we, the peoples. And when we speak about the transition from the MDGs to the SDGs, the so-called Sustainable Development Goals, it's important, first of all, to recognize that we still must achieve the MDGs themselves. And we're in a moment of critical transition here at the United Nations, and I would say as an international community where we are looking at, on the one hand, the achievement of the MDGs. There will be a special uh, event at the UN General Assembly in September of this year, where we'll be looking at the state of, you know, the, the state of affairs of the MDGs and what we need to do between now and 2015 to achieve them at every level, local, national, global. We're also now looking at the post-2015 development agenda. And we just had, in Rio, this past summer, the 20th anniversary summit, the Earth Summit, where we reviewed the commitments made in 1992. And I think we recognize with, the, with increasing alarm how far we are and how far our governments are in, in fulfilling the commitments they made some 20 years ago. Indeed, one could say 40 years ago in 1972 in Stockholm. So here we are with a complicated agenda before us. Rio Plus 20 established some 12 or more intergovernmental processes that Chanteline Carpentier will outline for us. And what the member states did, what the governments did in Rio is they basically we shall say, kick the can down the road by deciding to create different decision-making processes in the UN General Assembly to fulfill the goals of Rio, while at the same time making decisions to create intergovernmental processes to establish a post-2015 development agenda. Our argument as civil society is that the post-Rio agenda and the post-2015 development agenda must come together to create a single global development agenda where there are, single, there are new uh, global development goals 
that will uh, continue the work of the NDGs and expand uh, upon it. So I think what I'd like to introduce in the conversation here is to invite your continued participation in the Agenda 21 process that created the major groups system. What are the major groups? There are nine major groups. Major groups of what? Nine major groups of society that the United Nations recognized as being vital. Their active participation is vital to achieve a sustainable world. These major groups include women. They include children and youth. They include business and industry. They include trade union and workers. They include NGOs. They include science and technology. They include other groups not recognized by the so-called major groups, which includes, well, there's the, it, thank you, the indigenous peoples are recognized. But there's a very important group not recognized that sits here among, you know, among us, and that is faith-based communities. Volunteers are not uh, included in the major groups. Uh, the disabled community. So there are a diversity of groups, all of whom have a role to play. And I think they, you know, let's go back to the founding uh, spirit, if you will, of Agenda 21. And that part of that, part of the genius is that it recognized that each of us have a vital role to play. And yet I would say 20 years later, we have barely scratched the surface. Because what we as civil society need to do, and those of us in the room here, we need to revitalize and make real the connections between those of us who do work here at the UN, and the DRC, in Louisiana, and the local communities. So I look forward to continuing the conversation as to how we can make these links and how those, you know, each of us as citizens can lobby our governments, not only here at the UN, but in national capitals, and how we can bring our different international networks together in a more coordinated fashion to do so. I'd like to come back to you, Jeffrey, later on what you mentioned about the creation of a single global development agenda. Uh, help imagine with us the transition from MDG to SDG. If, they, if we are failing in the MDG, what insurance are we, uh, do we have that the SDG this time will